Welcome back to Artist Talks at SadCoverStudios.com, where we have conversations with artists about art, art history, art culture, and where they intersect with sociology. And today we have, from the Chicago land area, Rachel Scotland. How you doing, today, Rachel? <laughs> I'm fine. Hi, how are you? Well, tell, me a, tell me a little bit about yourself, Rachel. Uh, well, I'm a full-time artist, as you know. Um, I work at home. I'm a mother of two. Uh, like you said, I live in Chicago. Um, yeah, that's. I guess that's the really quick rundown of who I am. Well, let, let me say this. Let me throw some words out there just to start. Uh, okay. Coco and Magnolia. Viola ah. Gardens, Serena <laughs> Gardens, Catalina mm. Gardens, <laughs> Harvey, <laughs> which is one of my favorites, and Anubis, which is one of my favorites. I'm, mm -hmm. I want to recommend at the beginning of this uh, conversation that everybody visit RS Arts. You'll see it on the screen down here below somewhere. Uh, RSArts.StoreEnvy.com. Mm -hmm. And uh, you'll see it here. Go there and check out those pieces. It was hard for me to even put Anubis up there because I feel like that piece belongs to me already. <laughs> but I'm gonna go ahead and put it out there and let the rest of the world get a look at it. Uh, so where did you grow up? Where, where are you from originally? Um, I was born in Chicago, but I was raised in like the little suburbs of like Maywood. Mm -hmm. So that's where I was basically grew up at, so yeah. <laughs> did you say Maywood or Baywood? Maywood. Maywood. Okay, West yeah. Side. I guess it just did Northwest. Oh, uh, how, how would how would you describe the culture of that the community that you grew up in? Mm, well, at the time, uh, it's different now, but at the time, it was you know predominantly black, and basically it was still quiet. You know, mm. kids running around. So when I was younger, you know just stay on the block because mom said so <laughs> yeah. but it was it was very it was very quiet and you know kind of tight-knit at times but you know they had their you know uh festivities and things like that but it was pretty quiet at least that i know of. <laughs> now now looking at your artwork did you have some earlier earlier influences that influenced uh your style of 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 painting um I don't think it influenced my style, but more so like influence the things that I include in my art, which is like nature, because I was always outside. So mm -hmm. that's kind of like a strong point in my art that's always there. Um, like <laughs> uh, maybe since I was always quiet when I was younger, mm -hmm. there's only like one person in my works like one figure one female because i've always like been by myself even though i have siblings but other than that i don't think too many things outside like in the community influenced my work so how yeah, many siblings how many siblings do you have i have two younger sisters and one younger brother okay. <laughs> so i'm the oldest okay uh, it's the opposite for me i'm the youngest of five boys mm -hmm. so yeah oh wow, oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. So, what, what, what kind of, what kind of kid were you? What, what kind of child was Rachel? Uh, quiet. <laughs> quiet. I was quiet. Do, do you uh, know that's common with artists? It, I'm hearing that from everybody that I speak to. Yeah. Would you it, call it just, yourself shy? Yes, very shy. Some people say timid, but very shy very quiet stuck to myself i didn't really have too many friends even though i talked to some of the classmates or whatever or the kids on my block sorry that's my son coming in that's go okay. sit down go sit down <laughs> i understand so, um, uh, yeah so i was just i pretty much stuck to myself like mm -hmm. i love being outside i love playing with my you know papers pencils coloring markers, yeah. whatever, crayons. I'm like very big on crayons. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but yeah, that's pretty much what I, you know, I didn't do too much, you know, stuck to the family. Um, wasn't very active in, in my school, like, like sports or anything, but 
whenever like there was an art competition, oh yeah, I was there for it. <laughs> okay. So you started yeah. early. You started early on with art then as a as a child and very because yes, yeah, because my uncle, he's an artist. So okay. I kind of saw him doing art and like I guess I was like, okay, yeah, I wanna do that too. Okay. I'll do that. And then um my dad, although he's not an artist, he's a mechanic. Mm-hmm. And usually when he was doing my homework with me, he was always drawing cars to the side. So I'm kind of, you know, like, okay, he's drawn. I want to draw too. So it was like interweaving throughout things in my life. So. That's interesting. So yeah. you had some early influences that that led you down this path. Yes, <laughs> yes. And it was very encouraged too, because, you know, my mom, she was like, you can do whatever you want. And I was like, okay, this is what I'm going to do. <laughs> and so like, I had a list when I was very young. I was like, I'm either gonna be an artist, a veterinarian, a judge, or architect. (laughs) So yeah, I was like, well, it whittled down to being an artist. (laughs) Oh wow. And you had a you have an interest in interior design as well, if am I correct? Um, I kind of went to school for it for a little bit, but it didn't pick up fast enough for me. I was trying to get to color. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and it was stuck on, you know, like the CAD programs and Revit and things like that. And I'm like, ah, I need color in my life. <laughs> yeah, understood, understood. So are you a, a, do you love music? Are you a music lover? And okay. it's, it's a two-part question. Okay. Are you a music lover? And what role does music play in your process of creating art? Okay. Yes, I am a music lover. (laughs) And like, when it comes to my process and art, it's like, I don't have the music kind of control what it is that I do. Mm -hmm. I just have it on in the background to kind of be like, you know, have my mind going while I'm trying to focus on doing art. So it's kind of hard to say how it works, but I just like to have it as background, you Mm -hmm. know, but you know uh if i do listen to music most of the time i do like to listen to instrumentals yes so like i'm not listening to too many words and then i'm off doing something else (laughs) but yeah instrumentals instrumentals more than anything um yeah i find that my brain can kind of almost sometimes think about what's going on while the instrumental is playing. Like I can kind of envision like maybe the scene of what's going on, but it doesn't go too much farther than that. <laughs> when, when you think about it, and th- that's a common uh, answer from artists, mm-hmm. I, w- I would give the same answer. The music is not necessarily controlling or yeah. impacting what I'm doing. So mm-hmm. I like to describe it as a soundtrack because yeah. if you listen to the soundtrack to a movie, all the songs are not about the movie itself. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> it's about the mood of the movie. Mm-hmm. So at certain points, you'll hear a song to describe the mood. So it's mm-hmm. really it's really just a soundtrack that's yeah. playing in the background. Yeah. And I, I do the same. And it depends on how I'm feeling. One day right. it might be yeah. uh, Kendrick Lamar. <laughs> Another day it might be NWA. Another exactly. day it might be... Exactly. Um, you know, some jazz or whatever. So yeah, it depends mm-hmm. on the mood. Uh, I also, so- <laughs> um, when I'm also doing my work, I also listen to like Audible. So like the audio books. Oh, I love that the most. That's oh. like, yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. I really got into Aud- Audible when I was driving truck. Mm-hmm. And I think the last book that I read on Audible mm-hmm. was, uh, uh, I think it's called "You Can't Hurt Me." Mm-hmm. By this, oh, I wish I can't remember his name now. He's a Navy Steel, Navy Steel, uh-huh. uh, this uh-huh. brother from uh, from Buffalo, New York, mm-hmm. and he's a really incredibly motivational type of guy when it comes to physical. Mm-hmm. And, and I got off into that book on Audible, and I'm like, oh, I love it. But yeah. when I'm painting, <clears throat> sometimes with books, it's even weird. I'm a book lover. I love yeah. reading, so. Yeah. Audible is a little weird for me to, yeah, to read a book that way. It feels weird even saying I read this book. (laughs) 
Oh, after you listen, listen to it. <laughs> you listen to it. <laughs> like I listen to it, so mm-hmm. I don't know. I'm a I'm a purist, I guess, when it comes to the to the book. Then. <laughs> yeah, I I think it was this one book that I read. Um, I, I'm probably gonna butcher her name. Um, Children of Blood and Bone by Tomi Adeyemi. Um, I I probably butcher her name, but Children of Blood and Bone. Okay. And the Tell voice. Well, you know, I'm writing that down right. Yes. Now. <laughs> The voice actors for those book, that book is just amazing. It just like really takes you away. And I found it so inspiring. I was like, oh my gosh, I have to do something for this book. Like eventually it's gonna lead to a painting somewhere. Like, I just feel like I need to do that. Other books, I don't feel that way so much. It's just like going on a journey while I'm yeah. painting. So, but yeah, she's she's really good. She has a second book out too, so. I can't wait to read that one. Well, that's listen, a, that's, listen. That's a great title. That's a great title for yeah. A Children of Blood yeah. and It actually mm-hmm. raised my antennas. So, yeah. so, so with some of your paintings, I, I wanted to know about your process of naming your paintings because your paintings have some really cool names, like the Viola Garden, Serena Garden, uh-huh. Coco and Magnolia. Yeah. Like what, how do you get those names? You do you have a process, or is it relatively random? Okay, here we go. So sometimes like when I'm working, a painting doesn't have a name yet. Like it it just don't. Or sometimes when I'm working on a sketch, I can have a name already for it. I don't know why it just happens. It's just different. I guess how I, how connected I am to the piece, it might take a while for the name to come or it might not. Uh, For Coco and Magnolia, Actually, I was drawing a magnolia flower <laughs> and I'm like, oh, she has cocoa skin. So I'm like, oh, cocoa and magnolia sounds pretty. <laughs> so oh. that's how that one came along. Yeah. Um, other times I have my sister help me name pieces. I'm like, I can't figure out anything. Um, she actually named one of my paintings before oh. and the name was Malela or Malila, something like that. <laughs> And I was like, oh, that's pretty. What does it mean? And, you know, I can't remember it now, but, you know, I was like, that fits perfectly. So um, other times I have to write names down, like a list of names. And I'll just, you know, go down the list and be like, oh, okay, that one might fit. Um, it, it just, it's just how it is. Right now I'm working on a series of paintings right now and I'm trying to figure out a name for it. And I'm like asking, you know, my partner, like, what do you think I should name it? He's like, it'll come to you. I'm like, that's not the answer I wanted. (laughs) But you know, that's that's just how it goes. Sometimes it will come to me at night or like while I'm working on it. It's just, it's really a touch and go type of thing. Sometimes it's it's like that with, uh... <clears throat> There's this one painting that I, I still have. It is right there in storage. It's mm-hmm. a, a Maya Angelou painting. Mm-hmm. One of I, I was probably ten years old, mm. and when I was finished with it, I really didn't like it. Oh. And one day I was putting some holes in the wall for a TV mount, <laughs> and uh, the TV mount broke or something happened. I had to take it down and mm-hmm. I had to hide the hole. So I put that Maya Angelou painting over oh, it. Oh, wow. And as I walked past that painting for a couple of weeks, mm-hmm. it grew on me and I started to like it. Mm-hmm. You know? And I started to see what everybody else saw because everybody else liked it. But right. that painting sat in a closet for about six years. <gasps> oh, like, my gosh. <laughs> unseen. And wow. I think the same thing goes for names. Some paintings just are unnamed. Yeah. The majority of the paintings behind me don't have mm-hmm. names. Some of them do because they're on my website, but uh-huh. the majority don't have names because it yeah. just hasn't, you know, it hasn't, it come, hasn't to come to you. Yeah. Yeah. So when did you start as a professional artist? What inspired you to become a professional artist first? Uh, I don't, originally what I wanted to do was actually join like a game studio type thing you know like a a concept art studio because i was doing digital at first well when i came back to art i I was doing digital and i was like i'm gonna join a game studio within like a year and i'm like i'm gonna be you know i guess being cocky i guess a little bit about my skill at the time Mm -hmm. (laughs) but i wasn't looking to really become professional at all it came to me 
you know, I wasn't seeking it. Um, I didn't have like an amazing portfolio or anything. Um, I just had like a few pieces on like Deviant Art. Are you familiar with that? Oh yeah, I, I, I okay. have an account on Deviant Art. Okay, so Deviant Art, and then some of my work ended up getting posted on like Pinterest, and I didn't know about it, but you know, people share things, and so I had um, an author contact me about doing a children's book, and I was like, "What?" <laughs> like, yeah. I don't, I don't think I, but I was like, just roll with it. Let's do it. <laughs> so I, I think that was like my kind of introduction into being professional, I guess. <laughs> um, and I've worked with her for years now. So, you know, once, you know, I was working with her, doing her books, and then I had the other authors contact me about doing their books. And I was like, okay, I guess I'm in this game now <laughs> doing children's books. And then, you know, uh, I was doing portraits, not um, traditional portraits at the time, still digital work. And I guess that's just where I was at the time. Mm -hmm. But stepping into traditional artwork and um, medium, I was like, I, okay, either I'm going to get business for it or I'm not. Um, so eventually I started putting out some work and then people were trying to hit me up for portraits again. And I was like, okay, I guess I'm doing the right thing. So, you know, if it's selling, continuously selling and, you know, people are demanding it, I'm like, I guess this is what it is now. So yeah. I, I guess it's professional yeah, or not. Yeah. Yeah, I, would, I would absolutely say yes. Cause I've seen a lot of your pieces and they are, they are professional quality. Oh, thank you. If nothing else, if you say, okay, I'm not professional. It's it's almost like what Charles Barkley said. I'm not a role model. Like, yeah. hey, look, look at look at what you do. It's incredible. Right. So, I, I would say, uh, yeah. That the the question I wanted to ask it was a a lesson that I learned from studying art history, and it's something that I do a lot. If I get into a slump artistically, what I do with the time is I study art history. That's mm -hmm. how I feel the slump, and the mm -hmm. art history will lead me back to. Um, being inspired to paint again because mm -hmm. I'll get bored with reading the books and, <laughs> and the articles and then I'll go back to paint. So you, I, it's, it's my way of forcing myself out of the, the slump so I can continually stay active. But mm -hmm. one of the lessons that I learned from uh, the Harlem Renaissance era, uh, the era of the Black Arts Movement in the 1960s, one element for professional artists, particularly Black professional artists, is, is that they all taught at the same time that they produced. Mm -hmm. And some of the artists, the, their bread and butter was teaching art classes as mm -hmm. opposed to selling paintings. So mm -hmm. some of them had a portfolio that was tiny. They didn't have much right. in regards to their own works, but right. they made a living teaching yeah. and eventually landed positions in universities. And a great example I could think of is, oh, Ooh, who's the best example? I say Lois Jones. Lois Milo Jones is a great example. She mm -hmm. was a incredible, phenomenal black woman artist. She was uh, early on pounding the pavement with her artwork, trying to get in galleries. And this is when black folks really couldn't get in galleries. Mm -hmm. And women couldn't really get in galleries in America either. So it was a tough situation for her. And something interesting that she did she, she would mail her paintings to a gallery. Oh wow! They would get the paintings and think this is a a white woman or yeah. you know whatever. They mm -hmm. would set up an entire show, and she would show up, and they wouldn't know that she was even there. Wow! And, and see the response. She's like, "Whoa, this is crazy!" So, and they would, she made sales that way too. Wow! So in a That's in a way, it was a lot of innovation, uh, a mm -hmm. lot of. Uh, creativity, even in the presentation of art. Mm -hmm. But the bigger piece is she taught for, I think, 70 years. Wow. She was an art teacher for a long time. So wow. <clears throat> have you ever considered teaching? Uh, I th I've thought about it, but I'm like, I'm not a teacher. I, I've tried yeah. to teach. Like, I tried to do like a small little mentor thing, but I'm just like, you know, it went well, but I'm just like, that's not really my lane. Like, if people want to learn from me, I can do my best. <laughs> yeah. But 
it's not really my calling for right now. Yeah. Well, you can you can say that you're teaching by letting people see your your works. Yeah, <laughs> when, like when they you see can it. ask me questions and I'll point you in the best direction I can or help you out. So from from the first time that we spoke, one of the paintings that stood out to me was the Anubis piece, mm -hmm. which uh, was incredible. And Anubis, for those that don't know, is a ancient Egyptian deity. He was kind of the caretaker of the dead, the place of the mm -hmm. dead. If you want to say cemetery, we can say cemetery. He kind of was the caretaker of that in the embalming process. And and I want to say go to rsarts.storeenvy.com. Name will be back down here again. Uh, and look for that one painting and give it a look. Just look. No, I'm not gonna say that. Go ahead and buy it. Be <laughs> it. But, like, don't uh, take it from me. <laughs> but that painting is uh it has a tremendous amount of cultural influence, and a lot of your paintings do. Where did you get that that uh inspiration from to go down that lane? Uh okay. Um that piece, I was working on it years before I even did the painting. Well, not years, but a year or so before the painting was finished. Um, I was doing a sketch and I was like, just drawing at night, like 11, between 11 and one in the morning. Mm -hmm. And I was just drawing. And I was like, I, I need something to give me some more grit, I guess. And I need something different that I've been doing. And I normally don't draw men or paint men. So I was like, mm -hmm. let's go with that. Then I was like, I need something like, I want it to be fantasy-ish, but not all the way. Something that can connect to um, a culture. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna go down to Africa. I like to put um, influence from Africa, the culture, tribes, things like that, their na nature. Mm -hmm. um, so with the Nubis, I wanted to pull from a tribe of I don't know if I'm gonna say the name right, but Himba, Himba, H I M B A, mm -hmm. is a tribe of women. And of course, you like Anubis is a man, but I'm like, okay, we're gonna do that. And then um, I was inspired by uh, this sculptor. I think his name is Woodrow Nash. Mm -hmm. So I was looking at some of his sculptures and how he kind of used color and things like that. And so, uh, I kind of pulled a little bit of inspiration from him as well. Um, but the rest was just me. You know, I wanted Anubis to, or how you said it, <laughs> I can't yeah. say it. I always, got, I always say Anubis. <laughs> I, I hear but, people say Anubis, Anubis. Anub okay. Anpu, Anpu. Yeah, yeah, I've heard that too. And yeah. so, yeah, I was like, I want him to feel like Anubis. Mm -hmm. without actually looking like it. I want him to feel like he's kind of like more modern day. If he was a God walking around in a more mm -hmm. modern day situation, um, what would he look like? And uh, I thought to stretch his neck, cause like in the African cultures, you know, they use, or other cultures, they use the rings to stretch their neck, but I didn't want that to be like him to be wearing like the brass necklaces or gold necklaces. I wanted his neck to be there, but the pattern on his neck to kind of symbolize the stretching, I guess. Um, and the jewelry, <laughs> I just love doing like really big neck jewelry pieces. So <laughs> I thought to add that and, you know, scales on the jewelry represent the scales that he would use to judge you know, to judge you if you were going to the afterlife. Mm -hmm. So that I thought would be a cool little, you know, little trinket in there. And in his necklace, you see the galaxy. And to me, um, I don't know if you ever seen like American gods. I, I don't know who they're with. Stars. Uh, or I, I know, I know of it, but I haven't seen much of it with uh, yeah. the brother Orlando Jones. I think. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I didn't watch much of it either, but I, <laughs> I've seen I clips. Did see the, huh? I've seen clips. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I only seen like a little bit when they introduced him, but this was after <laughs> or around the time. I don't know, but I realized that they had like doors or pick a door that you know that will lead to the rest of your afterlife world. So mm -hmm. I figured the jewelry piece that was showing the galaxy, like it acted as 
doors to different galaxies, even though it looked the same. So that's kind of, I guess, mm. my interpretation of that. And yeah, I just thought I just really fell in love. I love the piece. It's packed away right now. I would have pulled mm. it out, but <laughs> it was just, it scares me, honestly, sometimes when I look at him too long. <laughs> You know what I, know I what I see when I look at that piece, and again mm -hmm. below you'll see uh, rsarts.storeenvy.com. Uh, when I look at that piece, I see um, kind of a there's like a there's a conflict there there's a there's like there's a pulling between the old and the new. Mm -hmm. It has some elements that make me think of like Afrofuturism mm -hmm. with that ancient Egyptian style. Yeah. And it's yeah. completely fresh and new because the images of Anubis that we see are always two dimensional. Mm -hmm. And I've seen some digital renderings that people have done over the years of them. Yeah. But this one is kind of fresh and new. The long neck made me think of Ernie Barnes. You know Ernie Barnes? Remember the Good Times painting where everybody with the long arms and oh, legs? Oh, oh, yeah, it, yeah, yeah. It, made, it made me think of Ernie Barnes. Mm -hmm. but that, that grabbed my attention. But I'll tell you what really drew me to that painting and your instagram page actually mm -hmm. you took a vid you did a video of uh -huh. you painting that jewelry uh, and i saw some different shades of color uh, happening oh. there like i saw mm -hmm. i'm guessing like maybe a mm -hmm. yellow ochre and some type of green or something and the way you tease those colors together to make gold mm -hmm. was mm -hmm. it just grabbed my attention and also the scales it's interesting you mentioned the scales uh just a little bit of the the background and i don't get no history lesson right now but yeah. that scale um is your heart is placed on one side of the scale and it's weighed against the they call it the feather of truth yeah you know at the end and it's weighed against yeah. it and if it comes up you know short then mm -hmm. you go to the underlife you get on that raft so yeah. it, it's it, that part of it just like okay she's not just putting paint on canvas she's telling a story here oh, thank and, you. and that's what that's what grabs my attention about uh mm -hmm. your artwork so uh a, a big question i ask everybody um do you find your artwork to be or your process to be therapeutic at all is there a th therapeutic element to your artwork yeah usually like in the beginning when i'm starting my art or sketching it don't feel as therapeutic as i would like because I'm thinking, I'm trying to figure out what goes here, what goes there. Mm -hmm. Usually when I get to the therapeutic part, it's when I'm in the middle of the painting. That's when I'm like, you know, I've already probably blocked in some things and now I'm trying to probably render it out and make it more final, more finished. That's the part I feel most therapeutic mm -hmm. at. Like when it's towards the end of the painting, I don't feel therapeutic anymore. I don't feel like a sense of awe. I just feel like, okay, I need to make precise decisions on what needs to go here and when to call it done. It's always the middle for me when I feel like that's the most, it's the best area where I feel like I can breathe it. I don't know why, <laughs> I don't know why, but it just is. So do you, do you usually finish a painting? And as an oil painter, this is something that, some a topic that uh i come across do you finish a painting in one sitting or do you have even try to or does I've that tried. process linger on i've tried to finish a paint i have before but i'm usually not always satisfied with it because i'm like i can go in and do something more to it but i'm more of a layer on type like block it in it might be a little rough or wash throw in some washes of color come back again when it's dry, block it in, it's probably not perfect, and then let that dry. Come back in and really, on like the third layer or fourth layer, really try to get it as neat as possible mm -hmm. and more clean, I guess, and keep going from there. After that, I'll probably do like some glazes. And when I glaze, I paint into my glaze. But yeah, I'm more of a layer, a layer. <laughs> so you're not just a one, one and done painting? No. I'm too, I'm too picky for that. <laughs> yeah, same, same here. There's, there's some paintings that I'll go layers. Example, say the, the, the portraits above me. Mm -hmm. That, that's kind of, it's, it's a little bit layered, but not heavy. The one mm -hmm. right here, this mask, 
it mm -hmm. more layers. Like I really mm -hmm. went in, it's, a panel, it's not a canvas, it's a panel. So mm -hmm. I really went into layers to give it some more depth, you know? Yeah. And if I feel that sometimes I'll get into a painting and tell me if this happens to you, I'll go and I'm looking at this painting I'm talking about right now, it's 36 okay. by 24. And okay. I'm, I finished 90% of it, I'm at the top corner. Mm -hmm. I haven't finished, that top corner has been undone for two weeks. Because I lose, I lose the, it's almost like you're writing or reading and you uh -huh. lose your space mm -hmm. and I have to get that, that rhythm back or I'll lose it if I don't uh -huh. keep going. So mm -hmm. does that ever happen to you? If you stop, do you get like writer's block if you stop uh, with the painting? Okay. If I, if I leave the painting for too long, then I kind of forget what I, where I was going with it. <laughs> so then I'd be like okay this painting has to sit again for even longer until i remember what i was going to do with it <laughs> but i try to you know like when i try to finish the painting as quick as i can but yeah. most of the time that doesn't happen and so then i just gotta like remember what it is that i my intentions for the piece yeah. um and where i need to take it but it happens it happens to me <laughs> so before we get into our rapid fire questions i have uh one uh, one question i ask a lot of artists too is with, with everything that's happening in the world today you know people storming the capital the country mm -hmm. is more crazy COVID's happening everything is happening in the world everything is moving fast mm -hmm. uh what do you think is the artist's responsibility today if any, if any. Okay, See, mm. I was I was trying to mull over this. Okay. <laughs> I was thinking like, to be responsible as an artist, you have to be first true to yourself oh. first. Okay, you can't, you know, just because whatever is going on outside doesn't mean you have to, okay, change your art all the way and, mm -hmm. you know, draw people with masks on or riots or anything like that you don't have to do that to feel like you are being responsible to your times or what's going on. The first thing you need to do is be responsible to yourself and paint your truth. Absolutely. But yeah. It's like, for me, it's like, if I was to do that, I wouldn't be honest. My work wouldn't be honest if I'm like, okay, I have to paint a mask on this girl because everybody's walking around with masks or I have to paint this girl with a picket sign because that's what people are, you know, people are rioting or, protesting you don't have to do that mm -hmm. i just you just have to you know sit down and really focus in on what it is that you need to do first and that's to you know do the work that calls you naturally Absolutely. so yeah, i look at i i agree with you and in addition i i, I like to say that it, and i said this in the last interview that i did i just posted mm -hmm. it the other day Okay. uh that just be truthful just exactly what you said be mm -hmm. truthful mm -hmm. like uh and and on top of being truthful recognize and this is my own philosophy philosophy mm -hmm. that there are three kind of types of artists in the black arts tradition in that mm -hmm. lineage of going back to the 1800s with henry o tanner and others and coming all the way up to us today Mm -hmm. There are artists that are reflective, mm -hmm. that create images of what was in the past, like these masks and stuff like that, yes. what was. You got mm -hmm. artists that that capture the moment that is happening right now. Mm -hmm. And you got artists that paint our greatest aspirations, what we hope for yes. in the future. So they look ahead. So the mm -hmm. Afrofuturism, in that one pain, I keep going back to that pain. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm a little dog. I gotta get right so I can go ahead. <laughs> Y'all got stimulus checks, so go ahead and uh, RSI. <laughs> but uh, uh, it's a it's a combination of that future, what mm -hmm. we hope for, mm -hmm. and it's also you know that reflective uh, property is also in it. So yeah, they, they're all it. necessary. You know, they're all necessary. But for me, it's like. I don't want to paint what happened already. I don't want to paint what's happening, not really what's happening now. I want to paint something that we can look forward to yeah. or, you know, things that may not, like an escape almost sometimes, yeah. things like that. I, I don't want to have to paint what I see what's going on outside. It wouldn't make me happy. <laughs> yeah. 
it's interesting too because uh when you look at say other art forms like uh dance for example mm -hmm. borrows elements from generations that came before michael mm -hmm. jackson is james brown he's fred astaire he's mm -hmm. a lot of people you know in one prince is you know mm -hmm. james brown and uh a whole lot of other people <laughs> merged uh, jimmy hendrix all mm -hmm. merged into one artist and i think that that uh our only responsibility is to be honest in what we create and mm -hmm. if people love it or if people like it or if they don't like it mm -hmm. like it really doesn't matter as long mm -hmm. as the story is being told Mm, and and I always, the rest is just how they connect with it, it you know, exactly. this is how it's going to be. I listen to some of the artists online on Facebook and and uh, Twitter and they're, they get down uh, on their mm -hmm. artwork and because it's like, man, I, I'm not selling. Mm -hmm. I should just quit. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, if you think like that, you shouldn't have been in, in the first place. Right. Just get a gig and just paint and put those paintings in the closet for your grandchildren to pull yeah. out. Mm -hmm. And they'll say, man, you know, a hundred years ago, my great grandfather painted these paintings and they'll mm -hmm. love them more than you do yes. for that very reason, because it's a part of that lineage. Again, mm -hmm. it may inspire them to do some art. So, yeah. So now we'll jump into the rapid uh, fire questions as we get closer to the end. Uh, <clears throat> these are just quick questions. Get to know the artist a little bit. Real simple. Uh, mm -hmm. And you can just pop it out and you can elaborate on them if you want to tell me why. Okay. Uh, what, what's your favorite color? Black. <laughs> black. <laughs> hey, I like to wear black. Mm -hmm. I like to wear gray or dark, dark gray. Okay. And I like pink things though, <laughs> or <Okay>. gold things. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what What is your favorite word? It's more like a little phrase. It's just a touch. <laughs> just a touch. From the song? I so much. <laughs> From the song or just, just the touch? Oh, no, just the touch. But the oh, song, the, too, okay. I guess. <laughs> What's your least favorite word? Um, I don't curse. So those words. <laughs> Vanity, I, I got you. Yeah. What artistic endeavor would you like to try, but haven't had the time or the resource or whatever to really dive into it yet? Um architecture architecture yes Interesting. i love architecture it's like i love just looking at buildings you can see all those like little details or like certain things like the gothicness or art nouveau i love art nouveau you yeah. might see that in my art somewhere <laughs> yeah. but things like that it's just those little decorative elements sometimes in the buildings like old buildings like mm -hmm. not none of the new ones <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, you know, they tried to do that. And I'm gonna go to Chicago downtown. Mm -hmm. They tried to give that old look, even though the building's a little older now, but I remember when they yeah. built it, the Harold yeah. Washington Library. Mm. They tried to give it that old look. It was a modern mm. building, but they tried to give it some elements that gave it that old Gothic type of style. Yeah, yeah, it's um another building. <sighs> I feel so bad. I was like, I live in this city and I don't know the names of these buildings. <laughs> well, which building is it? Okay, it's like. <laughs> it's like... <laughs> Describe the building. I may be able okay. to say the name of it. It's, I don't know if it's the newspaper building or like, or it just has like these intricacies to like the shaping of the building. It's like, it's really oh my gosh! Well, it's the cold. sometimes the the the, the yeah. water, it sits on the the river. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that and it's one. kind of at an angle with all the glass. Yeah, yeah, yeah that it's way. Across the street <laughs> from the, it's across the way from uh, Jones Commercial High School is right there mm. across the way. Yeah, and it's also like another place. It's um over by the water tower. And it's like this little small little castle looking building. That's the water it's, tower. That's that is, is it, the water tower. Is that it? There you go. <laughs> That's interesting. So everybody yeah. go Google Google the water tower in Chicago. <laughs> the water tower place is a modern building, but mm. the original water tower, yeah, it's an old uh, yeah. Stone building, yeah. So yeah. last question. Okay. And if this moment were, were your last on earth, mm -hmm. and I was the last person that you spoke to. 
what would you want me to tell the rest of the world about Rachel uh, Scott? Oh my gosh. Mm, even though that she was, even though she's quiet and probably timid and shy, you know, she's very much a hardworking, dedicated <laughs> person, like competitive. <laughs> I probably don't look it very competitive. And I try to do my best with my work. <laughs> I don't know, it's kind of hard to talk about myself and to share my art with the world if possible and come up with your own stories if you have them, if you see my work, things like that. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and also go, go visit her website to, to buy her work and support her work. Uh, do you have a, a donation button on your website? Or um, it's inactive right now, but I can definitely reactivate it. <laughs> well, listen, everybody listening, if you get an opportunity, go to her site. You can, and I'm gonna put all the links in the uh, description below. You can go there, click her links, follow her on social media. Uh, go in, and if you get an opportunity, uh, donate to her site. It's always big to get um, support. If nothing else, just those views. Go in, like her stuff, subscribe to her her, uh, her webpage, and also follow her on social media. Uh, again, all those links will be below, and uh, some of them you'll see right here, right now at the bottom. Uh, like I said, go ahead and follow her. You can find me at SankofaStudios.com. You can find me at Sankofa underscore studios on Instagram. On Twitter, it's the same, Sankofa underscore studios. You'll find all this in the bio, too. But uh, I just need to announce that uh, July 19th, uh, Sankofa Studios is launching an Aaron Douglas masterclass uh, that will be, uh, it's going to be a deep, deep class, got a lot of elements to it. Uh, presentations, handouts, printables, the whole nine. Full class, you can learn a lot about the guy that's known as the father of the Harlem Renaissance. Uh, you can also find me on uh, this podcast, everywhere where you can find podcasts, on Spotify, Apple Music, SoundCloud, blah, 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 blah. You can go on, <laughs> on and it'll be there. But the link's all down below. So again, visit rsarts.storeenvy.com. Check out our artwork. You do sell prints, right? I do. Yes. She has prints and also she does commissions. As soon as the page pops up, you'll see a button for commissions. So go ahead and get a uh, big mama painting done uh, for the new year, you know, and uh, do some do that for the family, you know. Mm -hmm. So and, and I, I lastly, I want to thank you for coming on with me and having this conversation. It's been really oh, cool. Thank you. Thank yep. you and, uh, so much. I hope we could get as many people. We're going we're gonna to cash mob. Mm -hmm. RS Arts, and we're also <laughs> going to flood her Instagram and everywhere else where we can find her online. So this has been Sankofa Studios Artist Talks, again, by SankofaStudios.com. And until next time, peace. <laughs>